Look at that. Do you know this guy? There he is. Look at that handsome face. At 6'3 and 215 pounds, Francis Ellis is hard to miss. What's happening, man? Hey, man huge fan. Oh, love that. But the Freeport native and stand-up comic stands out even more now that he's found an unlikely success at Barstool Sports. Big fan, funny guy, blogs are funny, stand-up's great. Yeah, cool. let's, let's not make it about you, okay? All right, great. He's a personality for the controversial media giant and a co-host for their morning satellite radio show, Barstool Breakfast. Ahead of his first homecoming stand-up show in Portland, we talk Barstool's image, what he thinks Maine needs to retain young professionals, and what could have been if comedy wasn't in the cards. And I wanted to do a play on Barstool Breakfast and have breakfast with you here at Becky's Diner, yeah. but you had to go and get a turkey sandwich. I went turkey sandwich with enough chips to um, murder anyone with a carb affliction. You have an interesting story because um, I was watching the Behind the Blog series that you did with KFC, and you talk about some really personal stuff. Yeah. You know, from your childhood um, to, you know, how you even got to Barstool. Um. <laughs> this, this mic is like, I'm so sorry. <laughs> Struggling, it's like a slippery hot dog. It's, a night, <laughs> it's my nightmare. In your Behind the Blog, you talk about um, how difficult it has been to put yourself out there, be so vulnerable, and have all of these trolls and all these people just, you know, slamming you online. And it's obviously being from Maine. Maine is very low key. Yeah. So talk about what it was like, you know, coming from a state like this and being thrust into an environment like that. Sure. I mean, you know, I grew up in this beautiful state of ours on the water and sort of small town values and uh, kind of knowing everybody. You just know everybody. And uh, then I moved to New York after college and became a stand-up comedian and uh, that's its own scene. But you still don't, once you get to Barstool, you have a level of exposure that you've never had anywhere in your life and your entire life is put out there to be dissected and spoken about and there are forums about it and all this stuff and frankly I don't think I'm particularly that interesting why would anyone want to talk about me why would I set up an interview at Becky's to talk to you about well, you well yeah <laughs> right and but it speaks to the incredible popularity of Barstool and uh, and how much it's grown and sort of the the cult following that it has, especially right. in the Northeast and New England and all that. When in China. Barstool, not shy of controversy. No. But you guys are a behemoth now. How would you pitch Barstool to Jack up in Holton, who is literally the opposite of your demographic? For me, Barstool has changed so much in the last year and a half, even since I've been there. Um, ever since the Chernin Group acquired 51% of the company, consolidated everybody in New York City under one roof and turned it into a more of a multimedia company that does radio and podcasting and videos and all this stuff beyond just sports blogging and whatnot. Um, we've hired a female CEO, a fantastic female CEO, Erica Nardini. We have a number of female content contributors Everyone's finding their own voice, and there's a real like admiration and respect for the co-ed nature and the direction of Barstool now. And I would like to think that some of the sound bites or the jokes that have lived indelibly in the ink of the internet from Barstool's 14-year history yeah. are an outdated snapshot of where the company is now. And uh, I think that. I, I like to think that I personally am, am, am doing something different along with a number of different people and that I, you know, I'm writing essays and, and we talk about politics now and we, we, we're, I don't know, we, You're we're, we're diversifying yep. in a big way and, and trying to become more progressive and um, that's not just a natural thing and yep. it's cool while also retaining our common man mentality and... Yeah. Uh, sort of a lot of the unabashed, unapologetic tones that brought us to where we are. 
obviously, you know, Maine struggles to have people like us stay in Maine, young professionals who want to settle down here. Um, it's very much an aging state. Um, what do you think the state needs to retain people like you and, you know, instead of finding success elsewhere? I'd have to do a little research, but I think a lot of it starts with, uh, like, education. Mm -hmm. And obviously we have some fantastic colleges in Bowdoin, Colby Bates, University of Maine, USM, all that. But where are those people going? You know, why are they leaving? Um, because in Boston, obviously, there's like 39 colleges in Boston, and so many of those graduates stay. Yeah. I think it, it must be that just the job opportunities, right? That the the job opportunities for young people in Maine aren't what they are elsewhere. Did I see that you studied govern government? Yeah, I studied uh, the go government with a focus on the Arab world, and sa especially Saudi Arabia. Talk about that. What was your overall goal? I had a thought for a little bit that I might go into the State Department, try to work for the Foreign Service, whether it was like NSA or CIA or FBI or whatever. Get out, really? I guess the FBI is not Foreign Service, but um, yeah, I was very interested in like the geopolitics of, of the Arab world and as I was there you know the Arab Spring was happening and the whole world was kind of like catching fire and very interested in the Arab-Israeli conflict and I had some fantastic professors in that realm so I just gravitated towards those subjects and uh, I feel like that's such a little known fact like you wanted to be a government employee like super deep into politics essentially in like the economics of the world yeah sure but I think my perception of what I wanted to do professionally shifted. It was always a fluid landscape. And right. after school, for a couple of years, I tried to do the comedy thing and didn't feel like I was ever going to get anywhere. And so then I started applying to law school and got a job working in the district attorney's office in New York City. Oh, wow. Applied to law school, basically didn't get into any of the schools I wanted to go to. And then got into Fordham uh, okay. and decided to go there for four days. I was at law school for four days and then that said, uh, this is way too hard. This is not for me. <laughs> well, I wasn't ready to give up on being a comedian. So withdrew and that was the best decision I've ever made. You gotta do what you gotta do for yourself. That's right. So comedy, was that always? <laughs> I swear to God, is gravity harder in here? Like what? Why, Why is so much stuff falling? <laughs> Are we in a vacuum? That is the face of a man who has many skin suits in his closet. <laughs>